the record. Hello, welcome back to the Floke Summer School of the Virtual Science Forum. I'll uh, quit the introductory notes to a minimum um, and basically just say that, that um, we are a volunteer run initiative that uh, is um, built to host um, these types of online events for scientific purposes um, and feel free to join our efforts. Um, we're uh, on GitHub um, and everything is open source. So um, please, please join us. And we in particular acknowledge um, institutional support um, by the TU Delft uh, Kafli Institute for Nanoscience. Um, and this uh, Floke Summer School um, is um, has been going since last week. And um, today we have the second uh, lectures of Anusha Chandran and Monika Eidelsburger. And without further ado, uh, Anusha is going to continue and tell us more about quantized energy pumping and synthetic dimensions. Um, please, Anusha. Oh, um, thank you, Michael. Thanks again to the organizers. Um, hello, everybody. I don't know who's on the other side, but I assume some fraction of you were here yesterday. Um, so, uh, so the plan today is to keep going from uh, where we left off yesterday. Um, uh, so maybe uh, this was a slide I ended with. Um, let me see if I can just, sorry, get back. Uh, I wanted to just put up the, yeah, sorry. So this was maybe the, the um, big message from yesterday's uh, talk, which is that uh, even a, a qubit two-level system, you drive it with two incommensurate tones. Uh, it can uh, you can put it into a regime where it mediates an energy current between the two drives on average, uh, and that's what's shown on the bottom here. And what I tried to build towards yesterday was an understanding of where this uh, kind of effect came from by drawing analogies with band theory uh, and linking it to a topological invariant of uh, of some associated band theory to predict what the slope is, and and that. Uh, those kinds of predictions work really well. So today I want to uh, uh, leap, uh, go ahead from there and um, and and kind of give you a preview of what we've been up to in in along these lines in two directions. Uh, one uh, taking this effect and and uh, and actually probing it a bit deeper, which actually uh, uh, gives a, a a nice way to prepare non-classical cavity states. As I'm going to show you, that's that's two. It's an application of this effect. Uh, and three is is actually then going uh, is is stepping back, being a little bit more abstract and saying that's all very nice with one qubit and two tones, but uh, you know what else is out there? And this will take us a little bit more in the regime of steady states and their classification. Um, after three, I hope to have a little bit of time to tell you about generalized floquet solutions. You know, I this is a school on floquet um, systems. I'm sure you it started off telling you about the floquet theorem, which I don't seem to have mentioned at all. So you know. Is there a version of that? Um, what does that mean? And, and so I hope to tell you a little bit about that too. And this will uh, connect to some questions about chaos from last time. Okay, so uh, let us let me get uh, going. So I wanna um, describe to you uh, an effect which we called uh, cavity state boosting. Um, so what is it? It is a method to produce uh, non-classical states of light. Uh, for example, Fox states, um, you know, certain types of cat states, uh, superpositions of two different kind of coherent states, for example, macroscopically distinct coherent states, et cetera. Uh, and these kinds of non-classical states uh, of light, um, you know, they're very, uh, they're very hard to make, but if you could make them, then you can uh, harness them in uh, for different things. So you could, har uh, they, uh, you could harness them to do um, better sensing than is classically possible. Sorry, Anusha, I think you have muted. Sorry. Uh, I think yeah, I, it's I, okay now. Okay, Please so come. where should I where should I start from? We just well, missed one. Metrology. Oh, from metrology. Okay, sorry. I didn't I um so uh the non-classical states of light can enable beating the uh, classical limit of sensing to get to a uh, the quantum limit of sensing known as a Heisenberg limit. So basically uh, may let may let you make much better sensors than classically possible. <clears throat> and the second is 
uh, that these kinds of non-classical states uh, may themselves be the basis of doing quantum computation. So there are both there are proposals out there and, at the, and there's a being experimentally implemented in which instead of a two level system, a cavity itself is being used as the, you know, as a qubit, as a basis for doing computation. And in, in those kinds of setups, these non-classical states are, uh, they're the starting point. You need to work with these non-classical states to do computation. Okay, so for all these reasons, people want to make them, but they're hard to make. Okay, so uh, what I want to show you uh, is uh, is how to harness this effect of energy pumping that we talked about to prepare such states. And to do this, we're going to take uh, the setup that we described um, in some detail yesterday, qubit driven by two classical terms, and uh, quantize one of the drives. So this is an intermediate case uh, from the two pictures from yesterday. So there's one uh, classical drive, another, um, another uh, drive being replaced by a quantum cavity. Um, and okay, and then we want to work in a regime where even this system can have an energy current from the classical drive, say, into the quantum cavity. Okay, um, but this energy current just doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't go into the cavity and just, uh, as it were, get spread out and in space. Instead, what I'm going to show you is that if you prepare specific initial states of the qubit, so say, for example, um, for, for, for a protocol that I will show you simulations for in the next slide, you prepare up and whatever state of the cavity there is. At some uh, special times, you'll find that the energy that's gone into the cavity will, will rephase in Fox space to form the same state as you started with, except the uh, all the ends are, are boosted by a fixed amount, okay? Um, I hope this made sense. So the, there's an energy uh, current or photon current continuously going into the cavity on average. And at special times, all that photon current goes in to just move a state in end space rigidly over by a fixed amount. And this is what we call cavity state boosting because whatever the state was in Fox space, it's just rigidly been shifted to higher Fox numbers that you can deterministically tell what they are. So in particular, if you started with a single Fox state, you just get a, uh, a Fox state of a larger photon number at these special times, allowing you to prepare these non-classical states. Okay, um, yeah, I already said that. Um, and so this is uh, um, in response, I have this picture up here too, because I built this uh, synthetic lattice model yesterday. And I uh, we had focused on um, this regime at large photon numbers N1 and N2 in order to understand the qubit driven by two external drives. We said that was like taking the classical limit of both cavities. And now to understand this, this cavity state boosting, we, uh, you know, we take the same picture, but we look at a different part of the lattice. We allow the, um, uh, uh, so I guess here I've picked the cavity to have frequency uh, omega two. So um, we we go down to low photon numbers potentially of the cavity, but still um, stay at high photon numbers of the uh, drive one to be in the classical limit for drive one. Uh, and so yes, there was, there was, sorry for interrupting. Um, there was one question in the chat about the previous slide, um, asking okay. uh, what about coherent states. Oh, coherent states are uh, certainly boosted. Um, but they are, um, uh, that is something you could describe uh, in the kind of classic limit already, uh, if that makes sense. So coherent states, this energy current that we described yesterday, we did it actually in the, when I said the classical limit, those are actually, that's actually the coherent state limit for both cavities. Um, and there you can just, you can, coherent states are, will, will go to other coherent states thinking in that limit. I think what, what is less, was less obvious to us and this is what I'm going to show you next is that if you started with non-classical states, so that the uh, you know this this classical limit of coherent state wasn't obvious to start with, like you couldn't just take it that way. Mm. Uh, does one does this effect persist? And then two, uh, do you do you furthermore are you able to prepare the same state at uh, boosted at later times? And so I think that's the uh, that's a little bit more the surprise. Uh, so, Thank but you. this certainly implies coherent states uh, get boosted, and 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 uh, that's at the background of our understanding of how this happens. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. So there was a question yesterday that if you went to a cavity limit, does this uh, energy does this energy pump behavior persist? So I said yesterday. Short answer: yes. Um, and long answer is uh, you can definitely go uh, look. You can simulate the system I had in the previous slide, and and here's what you get. 
So uh, on the x-axis, I am plotting the uh, plotting time in units of the classical drive. So uh, I'm sorry, I should have had a picture of the of the cavity of the qubit in the drive here. But uh, the classic there's, there's a, a classical drive on the qubit that's uh, uh, that's got this uh, index one, and I'm measuring time in those units. On the y-axis is the photon number of the cavity, and what the color plot is showing you is what is the probability of having different um, photon numbers in the cavity. Okay. Uh, and so for the simulation, we start with this specific initial state. So the qubit is prepared in an up state, the cavity in a low photon number state. So I think uh, here it was, it was 10. Um, you can bring that down a little bit. Um, there's some, uh, you can't take it down all the way to zero. I'm happy to describe why uh, for anybody who's interested. Um, but okay, so we start here at up and 10. Uh, and then we let the system go. So it's a periodically driven qubit in a cavity. And you watch what the cavity state is doing as a function of time uh, in terms of these probabilities. So uh, first thing you see uh, crudely is that uh, the entire probability distribution is marching up in time, right? Um, and in fact, it's not just marching up in time at any old rate. The average rate is exactly what we predicted uh, based on this the, the uh, uh, band theory analysis we did yesterday. Uh, and, and that's the red line that I've drawn here. It's really, uh, it's exactly even, I think I even uh, matched up the numbers to be correct for this um, uh, for the uh, for, uh, for this plot. Okay, so that's great. So this is uh, so the short answer. Uh, so the question, a short answer to the question: Oh, does this effect persist in the cavity limit? Is yes. And look here, it is in action. On average, the uh, uh, average number in the cavity is going up. But on top of that, you can see there's more structure. Right, it's not just uh, going up and 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 washing off in like the uh, in structure in the sense that uh, quasi periodically, there's these blobs and they rephase to form very narrow distributions in N. And it is these points that we say that uh, where we say that the cavity state has been boosted because uh, N has now come to N plus N dot TM. Okay. Um, and this N dot uh, should be is, is this rate. So we know exactly how many photons we've transferred into the cavity. And then we get at those specific times, we obtain those box states. Okay, so this is something. Uh, this is just some, the uh, numerical simulation that shows you uh, that this happens. And so the at these special times, sorry, yeah, I didn't know I had the arrows there. So you can see them. The special times are are marked at um, where the these blobs rephase to be pretty narrow in N, and you get these kinds of states. Um, so that's really nice. So that's what we call cavity state boosting. But okay, why on earth does it happen? Um, can we understand it? Uh, uh, building off these wave packet dynamics we did yesterday? And the answer is, of course, yes. Um, and uh, to do that, we we should uh, look at a part of the wave packet dynamics we introduced yesterday that I actually completely ignored. I didn't even talk about it. So it was this uh, group velocity part for the wave packet in um, uh, in, in the synthetic lattice, right? Because remember, that was our real space, the synthetic lattice. So uh, what does that do? Well, what this group velocity actually does is it causes oscillatory uh, motion along the direction of the electric field. Um, and so this is, goes by the name of block oscillations. And let me remind you what those are and even ex uh, pretty explicitly work out block oscillations uh, for one dimensional tight binding model. Okay, so uh, so here is the, uh, here I've shown that in, in um, as a picture. So here is a tight binding model in one dimension that's X. Uh, it's in the presence of an electric field, omega one, with strength omega one. And you make a wave packet and you want to know what does the center of the wave packet do as a function of time. So you look at these two equations here, you write them in one direction, uh, in one dimension, you solve them. Again, uh, this bottom equation is easy because it just says that the there is a constant force acting on the wave packet in K space. That means its K value just increases linearly in time. Um, but that, and then you go, go to what it does in real space and uh, you uh, pl helpfully plug into this equation telling you the relationship between the group velocity and K. Okay, one step later, you actually obtain uh, oscillations in real space. Okay, so a, a wave packet that is just linearly accelerating in K space oscillates in real space. Um, and this is really because uh, on a lattice, um, K space is uh, compact, right? So Kx, um, uh, only takes value, say, within a Broan zone. So if Kx comes back to its original value, group velocities come back to their original value, and thus you have oscillations. Okay, um, so this is what will happen. And in fact, 
the uh, particular solution for our uh, setting will give you that the frequency of the oscillations is set by the electric field, uh, and which, which for us, uh, remember, was the frequency of the drive. Um, I know there's many frequencies bouncing around, but hopefully you're able to keep them straight. This is the external drive that you're applying, and that sets the frequency of oscillation of the synthetic lattice. Okay, but in addition to that, um, there is actually a second effect, which is not about this, what the center of the wave packet is doing, but what about what uh, about what its width is doing in time. Okay, um, and uh, so I didn't write down the equations of motion for that. You can, um, and uh, you'll actually find that the width also changes in time. So the wave packet, as it were, breeds. So it'll get fatter and thinner. But uh, exactly when the center comes back to uh, its starting point, the width also comes back to its starting point. Okay. And this is going to be important in us understanding our Calvi's acoustic. So th these are the two effects that happen. Center of the wave packet oscillates, and uh, the width uh, is uh, also oscillating in time. So the wave packet breeds. OK, so now we go, that's nice. That was in 1D. We can even solve it pretty explicitly. But let's go to our synthetic lattice in two dimensions um, uh, for, for the uh, qubit, for the same setup as yesterday. You, you build a wave packet. And remember, there was an electric field in this uh, model set by the frequencies of the drive. Um, so uh, and now, um, uh, in order to think about block oscillations, uh, we, need to, uh, the, we need to ask, when might the um, wave packet come back to close to its starting um, point. And for that, you need to know if there are two frequencies in the problem, omega 1 and omega 2, you need to find special times that are called almost periods for when these two are incommensurate, when they get almost back to 2 pi. They will never exactly both be equal to 2 pi, but they can both get pretty close. And at this point, if you repeated the block oscillation calculation in two dimensions on this 2D tight binding model with this electric field, you'll actually find that the center of the wave packet uh, comes back to nearly its starting point, but further that its width also comes back to near its nearly its starting value. Okay, so here is my uh, bad keynote animation of that. So the wave packet goes kind of back and forth, roughly along the line of the electric field, getting breathing and then coming back to its uh, original uh, width. But this, of course, ignores the uh, motion. This uh, the second term in our. Uh, wave packet dynamics, the one that we actually talked about yesterday, which is the transverse motion to the electric field. So really, when all this bouncing back and forth along the electric field is happening, it's also moving transverse to it, so that when it rephases, it's also translated perpendicular to the electric field, which is what we call, this is the F-boosting. So um, this is an animation that, uh, not animation, picture that Phil makes, Phil made that I think is also is helpful. So it tells you that uh, as the wave packet breeds, so the, the, the pink shading here is telling you the width of the wave packet. And when it gets narrow, it's rephasing. And so uh, it's rephasing at different times. Uh, and, and as it has moved transverse to the um, electric field, the, uh, when it rephases, say the N2 value is different, right? And that's cavity stable state. Okay, um, I had a question yesterday, I'm pretty sure that said, uh, that uh, someone asked, you know, uh, is it so important that these drives be incommensurate or, or what if they were commensurate? Um, I, I, I maybe somewhat punted on them, but here is a, here is a uh, on that question, but here is a concrete um, a figure of merit telling you, showing you a difference between incommensurate and commensurate drives. Okay, so, uh, so this is um, for a ratio of the, in, of the two, uh, the cavity frequency to the drive frequency being irrational, um, picked to be the golden mean, which people, uh, you know, refer to them as, as the most irrational number, um, and uh, versus a, a low uh, commensurate ap approximation of it, so three halves. All right, and what's being plotted here is uh, what is the variance of this uh, distribution uh, at the special rephasing points? How 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 well does it rephase uh, as a function of time, as a function of these rephasing times? Okay, so this is the quality of rephasing. So you actually see that in the blue, when you have incommensurate drives, the rephasings are getting better and better as you as you look at further and as you boost it to higher and higher n, they are, the width in n space is getting um, uh, sharper and sharper. Whereas uh, in the commensurate case, it's getting worse and worse. Um, in fact, if you I think if you looked at the slope of this curve, uh, I think you'd find that the um, the, ver the uh, width is growing linearly in Tn. So I guess the variance would grow as uh, Tn squared, okay? 
So this, this is where it's uh, one place you can see clearly how uh, incommensuration coming in. Incommensuration is actually coming in uh, because uh, for incommensurate drives is where we're able to show that the average anomalous velocity, the velocity perpendicular to the electric field, um, is, uh, is the same irrespective of the state. Whereas when you have commensurate drives, that's not true. So, um, uh, so when you build a wave packet over time, the fact that the wave packet is a superposition of different kinds of uh, um, the, uh, states in it uh, means that, and, and they're slightly different anomalous velocities, means that you actually get that its width just grows in time. So its quality of rephasings get worse. Great. Anusha, uh, maybe that's a good time to ask a question, which I deferred um, in the chat uh, a bit. So there was a question about uh, if you go back to the uh, picture where you show the, the rephasing in time no, a bit earlier. Uh, that one. Yes, the, that, exactly. So what determines the spacing between the, the, the special times? Oh, uh, that's a great question. So um, the that is determined by these um, you know, so what were these TMs? I don't, I, I uh, maybe only implicitly said what they were. So they are known as these almost periods. They're actually set by the particular frequencies that you pick. Um, so when we pick these uh, golden mean type ratio, that determines what these almost periods are. Uh, and thus uh, where uh, omega one uh, times T and omega two times T is approximately two pi. So that's how we mark these arrows. Uh, arrows are theory based on um, uh, uh, understanding that uh, omega one and omega two, uh, when omega one and omega two come uh, times t comes close to two pi. Right, okay. Yeah, and, and uh, 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 sorry, one, just one technical comment here for anybody who is interested, it's in the paper if to see, uh, welcome to look more. Um, there are, in order to do that more quantitatively, you have to look into some, uh, corrections of the frequencies of, of the cavity due to the coupling to the uh, qubit. Oh, right, right. Of course, yeah, there's some coupling, yeah. Um, so Fabio has a question. Maybe maybe you can also ask right now. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. An Anusha, uh, nice presentation. Look, uh, could, could you show again that picture when you show the oscillation in the width? Uh, I could miss some point, but how can I figure out phenomenologically this oscillation in the width? Oscillation to the width? Um, yeah. It's actually because uh, if you looked at this, uh, um, the, the velocity of a particular uh, K value, right? Um, is, it, this is the group velocity, which has a little bit of K dependence. So if you go and look here, this is the group velocity for my 1D model. Um, in a wave packet, it has a little bit of variation. So as the wave packet moves back and forth, the leading edge and the uh, edge of the back move at slightly different velocities. And that's, that's, the, that's the origin of this breathing. Right, thank you. Okay. Oh, was there any other question, Michael? Um, no, please continue. Okay. Then let me... Yeah. All right. So that's that was the effect. That's the origin on, from the same uh, kind of wave packet picture we were building yesterday. And now, of course, we turn to um, this is all very nice, uh, but can anybody realize this in the lab? And and what what are the ingredients one needs uh, to realize this kind of cavity boosting effect? Okay. So um, so uh, maybe now it's time to write down a, a little bit more explicitly the form of the Hamiltonian for the specific setup. So let me write it. So the uh, first term in the left here is the cavity um, energy, um, it's fine. Then uh, there is a um, uh, interaction between the cavity and the qubit. Uh, it's uh, JC is Jane's Cummings. It's of this Jane's Cummings type, which is basically you de-excite the cavity and excite the qubit or vice versa. Uh, and then there's uh, an, uh, another classical drive on the cavity. So this is the ingredients that you need. Now, if you looked at the bare scales in this problem and the hierarchy that you need for this uh, energy pumping effect and also and thus also the cavity state boosting effect, this is the hierarchy that you actually need. You need that the cavity energy and the external drive frequencies are the smallest uh, frequency scales in the problem, in particular, smaller than the um, James Cummings interactions term, kind of the average scale of this uh, uh, BC uh, term on the spin, you know, interaction scale, qubit splitting, et cetera. Um, and, and this is 
you know, if you go show this bare Hamiltonian to an experimentalist, they will certainly make faces like this because, um, you know, this is not at all a natural hierarchy because it tells you that, uh, among other things, that the what this one of the strongest scales in the problem is the interaction between the cavity and the qubit, and it's hard to crank that up. So, you know, we would call this ultra strong coupling if you wanted to crank that up to be the largest scale in the problem. Um, and so it's, it's, it's hard to get, basically it's hard to get photons to interact with anything, including qubits. Um, and so cranking up that scale is tough. Um, but uh, something simple we realized um, is, is actually that you do not realize, need to realize this Hamiltonian in a bare lab frame, but you do, can realize it in a rotating frame. Um, so we have a lab Hamiltonian that looks a little bit different now. Uh, it's got a, um, there's still a cavity energy. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a slowly modulated qubit splitting cavity qubit coupling and a classical drive. Okay, this is a little bit uh, written out a little bit more explicitly what they are. Uh, but now in the standard hierarchy of um, scales that is available in cavity QED or circuit QED, where um, these uh, the uh, interactions between the cavity and the qubit are, are not the largest scales in the problem anymore, the frequencies are. Um, I'm skipping some details here, but I just wanted to give you a flavor. So that in, in, the, in the normal strong coupling regime, if you go to the rotating frame, you realize exactly the Hamiltonian that we're after in the previous slide with the hierarchy of scales. Okay, so um, this is just to say that with, with the ingredients of uh, slow modulation of the splitting of the qubit and other external slow drive on it, um, the uh, this uh, effect is eminently accessible in you know today here and now available circuit QED and cavity QED devices, and indeed Alicia Kolar's lab at, at Maryland is uh, they've uh, they've built a device that is uh, that realizes this Hamiltonian. They're in the process of characterizing it, and so stay tuned. Hopefully soon, instead of showing you all these simulations, I can actually show you data on how well this works. Um, uh, and also hopefully also uh, the actual experimental demonstration of uh, building high Fox states. Um, Very good, can I, can, I, can I interrupt with another question from the chat? Sure. Um, the, the question was basically the, the deviation um, sort of, uh, between this incommensurate and the, the commensurate approximation, so to speak, that you showed, yeah? Um, you, you showed that there was a, a, diff, a big difference, yeah, this one, between yeah. the, the proper golden mean and the, the three halves. Um, so so, so the, is, the, is, is it a problem that the rational numbers are dense in the reals? Yeah, in other words, you can always find a, a, a very good rational approximation and, and how, how would this plot look like if the approximation is very good? Yeah, so uh, I mean, that's a good point. So I picked a pretty low order approximation of the golden mean here to demonstrate it. Um, but but there's always this competition. So if you pick a better and better commensurate approximation, it will, uh, for um, uh, the this slope of the red line will go down more and more. So in other words, it will still be proportional to TN, uh, TN squared, but you know, there's a front factor there, right? Mm. Um, so, so in other words, in order to know that it is commensurate will take you a longer and longer time. Right. Okay. Um, and and as, it, as it has to be, because in some sense, uh, you know, you, you never know if a number is truly incommensurate until you wait kind of as it were infinite time, if a ratio is truly. Okay. Okay, great. And another question regarding the experimental realization, would that, what would be measured there, the transmission through the cavity or... Oh, good question. So um, the uh, uh, there's several things that could be measured. Um, I think what you uh, what we want to measure most simply would be the number of photons in the cavity as a function of time, uh, and this can be done. Uh, so there's so the way they they uh, the way you um, would set this they're setting this up is they have uh, they have a readout cavity that's going to do the measuring. And a boost cavity that is doing the holding of these photons. And so when you run this thing, and if you're increasing the number of photons in the boost cavity, uh, then uh, that will change the uh, qubit frequencies because it's talking strong to the boost cavity and, and uh, the number of photons in the boost cavity changes how the, uh, the qubit uh, splitting. And they want to have a readout cavity that detects that. So that's one way to do it. It's not the only way. Um, and that's how I think we're going to start to look for it. 
if that makes okay. sense. Yeah. Thanks. But yes, you in, indeed, in order to be able to detect this, because you know, you have a the boost cavity is a pretty high quality factor cavity, otherwise all the photons leak out too fast. So you that means it's holding on to some number of photons that you are putting in by this boosting process. So then you have to have a way to detect how many photons are in there to know that you're boosting. Right. Thanks. Are there any further questions at this point? Doesn't seem to be the case, so please go on. Okay. All right. So um, that was uh, to give you uh, a feeling for why um, these kinds of you know, theoretical effects. I mean, I am a theorist, so I'm always excited uh, when um, there are nice connections between different, putatively different areas like e uh, band theory, static equilibrium systems and, and non-equilibrium different systems. Um, but but uh, I, I think the near term possible technological applications are also an impetus to, to study these things. So hopefully I gave you a flavor of that. And so now let me move on to, um, you know, just uh, put the theorist hat back on and ask, you know, what else is out there? Uh, are these, uh, are, is this really, a, are these new phases of So, oh, um, and, and a punchline is really this, which is that, um, and, I'm, and I'll, of course, I'm going to elaborate in the next few slides, um, that in order that this kind of uh, energy pumping that we've described in, in great detail persist to, uh, in the steady state, to really, you know, infinite time, no matter how long you wait when you're driving these systems, um, you actually need spatially extended systems. Um, and and so this is not something I emphasized, so it's worth saying saying out right here. Um, the uh, qubit plus two drive system that we have studied now, uh, in if uh, uh, the it actually does not pump energy between the drives forever. So how do you see that? Uh, so suppose it did pump energy between the drives forever. This effect kept on going no matter how long you wait. Um, that means on the uh, in the synthetic lattice, the stationary states, which remember stationary states describe the long time states of the system, uh, you know, they must have two properties. One is they must be delocalized on this lattice because uh, after all, if you're able to make a wave packet here and it indefinitely pumps energy into the other one, uh, that means there should better be a, a stationary state which is completely delocalized, which is what the wave packet will follow. Uh, and and the similarly, if the wave packet is moving one way preferentially, the delocalized states better be chiral. They better have some notion of going this way or, or going that way, which is they themselves have to carry an energy current. Okay, so this is somehow the picture of the stationary states on this 2D lattice that one needs to have this uh, pumping effect persist forever. Um, but you know, if you if uh, you've done any amount of um, just kind of uh, band theory or, or staring at a single particle wave functions on um, lattices, uh, you know, this kind of situation will immediately strike you as being unstable because uh, these two wave functions are physically, uh, but not physically, on the lattice, they have um, weight in the same, at the same N1, N2 type points, right? I really tried to draw them on top of each other here to say that they can, they have, they can both have uh, probabilities on the same lattice sites. So, uh, even if you could uh, set up this situation, um, it would be fine tuned because however you perturb the uh, setup, which is this, which is which could just be tweaking the strengths of the drives a bit, um, maybe tweaking the qubit splitting, the bare qubit splitting a bit. Whatever you do, you would expect them to couple these two, uh, two states uh, so that you end up with stationary states on this 2D lattice, which are actually um, uh, have a, uh, are localized in synthetic space, okay? And localization in synthetic space means that this energy uh, pumping cannot proceed indefinitely because you know wave packets at some point will uh, will realize that will 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 probe the fact that um, the long time states of the system don't stretch in both directions infinitely. Okay, so uh, from from these uh, considerations, you can actually try to estimate. Um, what would be the lifetime of this pumping effect in this in the qubit, um, and um, and and this is what you get. You would it's exponential in the uh, the overall you know instantaneous scale of the Hamiltonian B naught uh, times the period of the drives or divided by the frequency of the drive. Okay, so um, the pumping is is a pre-thermal effect. 
but it's it's got this exponential dependence on this B naught T one. Um, so actually, experimentally, this is not at all going to be relevant to uh, the non idealities. Um, there are much more important non idealities that will limit any energy pumping that they see as compared to this. So it's why I didn't talk about it up front. But as a as a statement of oh, is this a phase of is this a phase of a qubit? The answer is no, because if you waited long enough, it's going to go away. Uh, so this is not something that characterizes the steady state of a qubit driven by two terms. Um, this was just uh, some early numerics that we did to confirm this, um, maybe in the interest of time. Yeah. Um, well, basically, all we did was we uh, define measures that tell you how the uh, energy current that you are, uh, that it's mediating is decaying in time. And then you fit, fit that to... Uh, um, did that to obtain a lifetime, and and uh, this the y-axis here is the lifetime of the effect, x-axis is the period of the drive. Um, it's a semi-log axis, so as promised, it's lying on a straight line, uh, and 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 the control and you can make the lifetime as um, large as you want by uh, simply taking the period of your drives to be larger, which is to bring down the frequencies. Okay, so if you um, remember up front, I said oh. Uh, or, or when you were talking about experimental con uh, considerations, I said, oh, in the bare lab frame, somehow the frequencies of the drives need to be the sm smallest scales of the problem. And that's because of actually this effect. You want the pumping effect to live long enough uh, that you can, you know, you can see it. And, and so that's, that's why you need those to, that to be the smallest scale of the problem. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, maybe that seems a, a little bit disappointing, um, but it actually suggests that there is a way uh, in which this uh, effect will per persist in the steady state. And that is if we could take those two uh, stationary states that we had in the synthetic lattice and just separate them here in real space, okay? So um, so if we now, instead of considering a qubit driven by two tones, if we now uh, made our system slightly more complicated, we have a one-dimensional uh, one tight binding model uh, of say free fermions, but now driven by two tones then we can engineer a situation uh, where um, there is an ed a mode localized to the edge of this one dimensional chain. Um, and the, the say the one localized to the left shown here in red mediates an energy current between the drives in one direction, whereas the one localized uh, to the, the right of the chain, the edge mode localized to the right, the chain shown here in blue mediates an energy current in the other direction. Okay. Um, so again, what have I done? Uh, I have, uh, it's as if the two states of the qubit that I had, I just, you know, separated them physically in space. And I'm able to do that with a third dimension. This is the third spatial dimension. Um, and um, and in this particular case, you can write down a, a, a bulk topological invariant, a winding number um, that takes values in the integers uh, that, that actually is a uh, characteristic of the steady states of this problem. Um, and, and thus, this will be this. Uh, where these is now we're actually talking about a new driven phase of matter. Okay. Um, so I, I made an implicit jump there when I um, said that. So it's, it's let me just draw this picture explicitly to tell you how we think about these things. So uh, I talked about this synthetic lattice um, for the case of a qubit driven by two tones, right? So then we had two dimensions uh, in our synthetic lattice to do with, uh, which we motivated through the. Uh, to st the states of the two drives, or rather the photon numbers in there, when we thought of them as cavities. And now we've added one more dimension to the picture, a real space dimension, um, so that our synthetic lattice now is actually three-dimensional. And when we go through this exercise that I did in yesterday's lecture, what you'll actually find is there's a general tight binding model in three dimensions. Still got this electric field in the, in the N1, N2 plane. Um, and so now we're somehow asking about the uh, single particle wave functions of this type binding model in three spatial dimensions. And what they actually look like in these non-trivial driven phases of matter are these. So in the bulk, the, uh, uh, the stationary states of are, are actually localized, but at the edge, they're delocalized and they are, um, uh, they're chiral. So the edge in one direction, they, uh, this this winding number actually characterizes the churn number of this two dimensional. If, okay, that's something you're uh, you already know from before. This would make sense to you, but at least uh, the important 
um, point to make here is that when you add extra spatial dimensions and we're talking about driven tight binding models, we can unifyingly think about them in the synthetic lattice picture with some dimensions being space-like and others being uh, uh, to do with the drives. Um, okay, uh, this slide is a bit busy, but uh, I wanted to say that, so, um, you know, this is not just uh, an abstract classification. Uh, we can actually um, cook up, and we have cooked up um, models, tight binding models that explicitly uh, show this energy current in their steady states. Um, so the kinds of ingredients that we've discovered one needs are uh, two site unit cells. Uh, um, we need localizing potentials in space, time dependent hopping between the sites, um, and you know drive frequencies comparable to other energy scales. So uh, it's it's with these are the kinds of ingredients that we have used to generically get these phases of matter, right? So they're robust to uh, all perturbations, really. They're not protected by any perturbation. Uh, they're not protected by any symmetry, sorry. Um, so uh, so what is the experiment that you will do to detect that you have one of these your driven phases of matter in hand? So here are uh, here is a one-dimensional chain. It's a tight binding model, um, and it's being driven by two tones. Uh, so I apologize. I hope this hasn't happened too much, but it's because uh, we go back and forth in our papers a bit. Omega one and omega two here. Capital omega one and omega two are the drive frequencies, not little omega one, little omega two. Um, and and so what do we do? We prepare an initial state where we fill the uh, sites of this one D chain from the edge, and we fill uh, S sites. Okay, um, because the two site unit cell. Um, this is for example, and S is equal to two example. Uh, and then we measure the energy current between the drives, and we ask, is there a time average energy current? And if so, what is, what is it? And that's what's being plotted here uh, on the right as a function of a tuning parameter that actually gives you access to both a regime that does not uh, uh, pump any current between the drives on average and one that does. Uh, and we can even, we know where the transition is, we can tune it, uh, we can check that the transition gets sharper as you uh, increase L. Uh, and furthermore, we, we can also characterize the transition itself as pumping uh, energy at half the quantized rate as in the topological regime, okay? Uh, but this is simply to say that there is a whole phase here in this one, driven 1D chain uh, in which when you fill uh, the state uh, uh, sites just from one edge, uh, you can mediate a energy current in one direction. If you fill it from the other edge, it'll go in the other direction. And this energy current, unlike the qubit case, lives forever. It's really a property of the steady state. Okay, so uh, that brings me maybe to the uh, most general thing I want to say, which is, um, you know, we can, uh, the, the example that we found of a driven 1D chain, uh, 1D chain with two tones is only one among uh, many possible ones, because there's a broader classification that, uh, uh, that we, we were able to do uh, for this particular problem. So take the more, most general setup of a D-dimensional hopping model or tight binding model, driven by n incommensurate tones, okay? And the question really is, is there a topological classification of the steady states of this kind of driven system? Now, um, uh, Mark Rudner, I think last week, um, I don't know if he discussed this classification, but he certainly uh, told you about the anomalous Floquet insulator, which is an example of a non-trivial phase of matter when you take two-dimensional tight binding models and drive it with one tone. Um, and he described how it had one-way moving edge modes, I'm sure, and such. Um, and so there's a non-trivial broader classification with, for just one tone driving or Floquet driving that uh, these authors have figured out. And the anomalous Floquet insulator is an example in that classification. And what we did was we actually did the more general classification for any number of tones. Uh, and the answer for, is there a non-trivial classification? The answer is yes. So let me show you what it is. Um, so it turns out that uh, all that matters for this classification is the total synthetic dimension, total number of spatial dimensions, little d, and total number of drive tones, capital N. When this, um, when this sum is even, there isn't, all phases are trivial in the sense that there is, uh, the steady states, uh, in the steady state, there is no notion of distinct phases. Whereas when the sum is odd, there, uh, there are distinct phases um, uh, classified by a winding number, which takes integer values, okay? Um, and so just to check, um, uh, the example that I gave you uh, in the last lecture was a qubit. A qubit has zero dimensions, so little d is zero, and capital N was two, so that put us up here. 
And indeed, in the steady state, there was no um, uh, energy current response. Whereas when I went to one higher dimension, I made this odd, and indeed, that gave us the, um, the an example of a phase belonging to this non-trivial classification. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I see 11.45, so I can say more, but um, why don't I pause here for if there are any questions and, and then you can decide how much more I should say. Great. Um, thanks so far. I don't see any questions in the chat right now, but um, maybe someone has a question. There's a raised hand, yeah. Um, please. Joshua. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I was just wondering a little bit about this picture with the, the rephasing again. And... Uh yeah, sorry, it was a bit earlier in the talk. Um, this one, or you wanted to see the actual and this one? one? Yeah, that one, I think. Um, yeah. and, and maybe you've answered this already, but I was wondering if I'm if I'm a wave packet on the lattice and I'm moving in a direction that is like an incommensurate slope determined by the driving frequencies. If yeah. I have a finite width, then isn't it going to sometimes look like I actually moving at a rational angle, if those words make sense, because I'm a wave packet with a width, I'm sometimes going to hit these lattice sites that I wouldn't if I was just a like an infinitely sharp trajectory. Um, actually, it, you don't even need to make a wave packet for that. I think for all states, initial states, classical as well as non-classical on the synthetic lattice, mm -hmm. um, there is a time up to which a commensurate approximation reproduces the same dynamics as the incommensurate one. And, and it's just the longer you wait, the, um, uh, um, uh, you know, larger the, uh, so the way we like, to, we like to think about this is, you know, there's two frequencies in this game. Let me see if I, here, there's two frequencies mm -hmm. in this game. And uh, you want to know uh, omega one divided by omega two, and you want to know um, can I uh, approximate it by uh, p on q, a rational number? And uh, the answer to that is yes. And the larger the time to which you want to do this approximation, the larger the integers p and q will become. Um, and which is to say, the larger the period of an effective, uh, uh, the period of these two commensurate drives. So does that right. make sense? So in some sense. If I, you know, I did, we did these uh, numerics with machine precision level um, a definition of the two frequencies to be incommensurate uh, and to be, yeah, to be incommensurate, specifically the golden mean. But of course, there's some precision there. Um, and we, we can, uh, but for the times we run, we can, we could have used a uh, sufficiently large rational approximant for these two frequencies. So they were commensurate and we would have found no difference. Okay, so the so the the width of your initial state or something like this doesn't play any role in this discussion. Um, not, yeah, it it needn't. It's this okay. is really true for all states. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Right, um, Babak. Yeah, so maybe on this same slide, uh, when you put the arrows on, uh, I think I noticed that there are some points that the arrows don't capture. Is that right? Yes. And, and yes. why? Okay, yeah, good, great question. Good eye. Um, so uh, now this is uh, this is always in, in the guts of uh, all these incommensurate um, frequencies. So, you know, when you have two, um, uh, ome o uh, when you have omega one and omega two and their ratio is irrational, there is a, a series of um, P on Q rational approximants that are quote unquote the best, mm -hmm. um, uh, right? For and 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 the best by by a particular criterion that I could describe. But then there are several other uh, rational approximants that are um, not as good but pretty good. <laughs> so there's a whole hierarchy of rational approximants, basically. So what the blue arrows are 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 these best rational approximants. But these uh, ones we have been able to work them out as like the next best ones. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, but that doesn't stop there. There's like there's a whole like I say, there's a whole hierarchy. So 
it's always going to look like there are more rephasings than the blue arrows that we draw with the best. I see. So is there is there like if you if you did this hierarchy, it looks like there should be some kind of fractal structure here. I don't know. Um, yeah, there's. I think <laughs> there's all <laughs> kinds of. So it, it it's like if you you can dig as deep as you want into these yeah. um, in, in, into this game of um, rational approximants, and so I think so. The best so for the golden mean, you probably know this. The best rational approximants uh, come from Fibonacci numbers, but then there are. I think what are known as Lucas numbers, which are okay. Uh, they are they're um, they're not so the Fibonacci numbers f n minus one plus f n is f n plus one. So the Lucas numbers I feel like are they're related to Fibonacci numbers, but maybe they're multiples or you know it's okay. and there's a whole series of those. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, and those give you pretty good approximates, uh, but then you can keep going. So there's a there's a uh, there's an infinite hierarchy of these. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. But actually, yeah, you can see here too. So let me. What's a good example? So here's here's one. This one. This rephasing is at seven. This came from one of our best approximates. Um, but if you go look at fourteen, you can see that you know there's almost a rephasing, mm-hmm. and you cannot. So um, multiples of best approximates that you find. Can themselves be good rephasings? They just get progressively worse as you go up there. You see. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. So 21 will look even worse yes. unless it ends up being a best of books. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's some kind of distribution. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Great. Um, there's another uh, raised hand um, lobby. Uh, hello. Uh, <clears throat> So hi, Anusha. Thanks for such a nice talk. So I had a naive question on the last part of the symmetry classification, where you were talking sure. how uh, yeah, uh, you could Anyone classify packet. different uh, topological phases. Now with the D plus N. So, yeah. so you mostly, uh, you, so in that slide, you showed for the symmetry class A. So I'm just wondering, yeah. is it possible in this N in commensurate drive case that you will not be able to capture some special symmetric classes. For instance, because of a drive, I would assume that you will always break some time reversal symmetry. So is it possible that there would be some phases which cannot be? Yes, yeah, I think so. I think the uh, the reason that we only did symmetry class A is um, somehow that's um, the most generic. And mm-hmm. um, and if you go through the 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 outlines and Brouwer classification and look at look at all the rows, most mm-hmm. of them are pretty meaningless um, with drives in the sense that, as you say, time reversal symmetry is not at all natural. What they end up being is um, several of them. Uh, I think everything except uh, charge conjugation uh, is requires special tuning of your drives, um, which is not. Right, it's okay. not sure which you can do, but it's not a phase in the sense that any there's no reason your derives would respect some funny symmetry. Like uh, you okay. take the like for example, one one could be that if you wrote the derives down, they have to be uh, even about t is zero or something like that. Now there's no reason that would be true. Of course, you can engineer it with some precision, but mm-hmm. um, but that's that's what a, most symmetries are of that form, except charge conjugation. So we actually do know the. Classification even with charge conjugation. Um, I'll have to pull it up. I don't. We never wrote it up. Uh, we, it was a referee response <laughs> level comment, and then we let it. Okay. Be. Okay. Uh, so just uh, a quick follow up. So uh, do you also have like as you in the same slide you mentioned about this anomalous Floquet insulator? Do you also have it anomalous Floquet version in this drive? Probably you said it. Maybe I missed it. In this two drive with one space, do you have such an analog of yes. anomalous? Yeah. So actually, um, the in in this in the following sense. So we like this synthetic uh, lattice picture with, you know, um, because and and the classification being only dependent on d plus n tells you that really you should be thinking in this you know in this space, mm-hmm. not especially not separately in space and in number of tones. If you were thinking just about classification, mm-hmm. but when you do that, you see that all many different physical systems fall in the same class. So the two plus one version, the one that you maybe heard about last week, mm-hmm. um, it is in uh, sums up to three, right? 
Mm-hmm. But that's this, the one plus two, which is the one I had in the, which I showed you an example for, also sums up to three. So we can, um, these are, it tells you that uh, um, on the synthetic lattice, these look similar, but then uh-huh. you go back, to their, physically, they're very different. One of them is two dimensional head binding model driven by one tone. The yeah. other is one dimensional model driven by two tones. Uh, they're physically how they manifest that they are different. Uh, phases of matter are also different. In um, the anomalous Fouquet insulator, it was a charge current going around the edge, whereas uh-huh. in this one, it is a, a energy current going between the drives. But on the synthetic lattice, they all look the same. Does that help? Oh yeah, yeah. So in that, in that, uh, so in that sense, it does matter what, uh, even though it adds to odd. Let's say one plus two, but it does matter what is what, what is what value. Like two plus one is not same as one plus two in at least in the physical sense, like how do you yes. observe? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, but but classification, this this kind of classification tells you that they are they come from the same place. The reason okay. they are all non-trivial is from this for the same reason in the synthetic class. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, I think there's a somewhat related question in, in the chat. Um, why do we always get a Z invariant for the driven topological phases? Why not Z2? Um, the, I don't, so I don't, <laughs> I don't know. There might be Z2 invariants in, um, uh, within, in the, in other symmetry classes, potentially, uh, um, I think maybe, okay, actually I can give an answer that may maybe be a, a bit more useful. So one way to understand this classification, why is it Z? is it's actually the same classification uh, in, in symmetry class A of static systems in one lower dimension, okay? So uh, so if you're, if uh, I should have maybe put that up too. So the symmetry class A classification of, of just static tight binding models, no, no symmetry, is that when their uh, spatial dimension is even, they have a Z classification. And when it's odd, it's trivial. Uh, we, we, it's the same classification for us, except shifted over by one. Um, so that when it's odd, we have this integer and it's even it's zero. And that's not an accident. It's because if you go look at the synthetic lattice, it's a tight binding model in deep and dimensions, but there's this important electric field. So what electric fields do to tight binding models is they always cause stark localization. So all the wave functions that uh, you um, that are that are the uh, stationary states of this tight binding model are localized along this electric field direction. So that effectively reduces the number of dimensions by one which is why we then reproduce the same classification as static systems in one lower dimension. I don't know if that helped, but that's why there's no Z2s here. <laughs> now, right. can there be, because if you do other things, I don't know. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I guess we won't get to any further content, but uh, Lavi, I guess, has a follow-up question. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much, Michael. So just a very last question from me. So I'm just wondering how could you engineer, let's say, higher Z number, uh, let's say higher, uh, more number of chiral light states in these systems. Is there like a protocol you have, like you could have? Yes, I think so. Uh, so um, we could definitely do it. So I didn't talk about how we wrote down these models, but we have a coupled layer construction for these models. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... Uh, we and that's why we even are able to tune these transitions and study them and know where they are and such. Um, so yeah, in that couple layer construction, we definitely extend it to be um, to to engine, you know, ha- getting uh, whatever integer you want at the edge by okay. adding copies of these things. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right. Very well. Um, I guess uh, we should uh, come to a close and uh, thank Anusha for. The, for this lecture and also for yesterday's again. Thanks very much. That was great. Oh, sure. I'm sorry I didn't get to the, the last bit, generalized bouquet solutions.